Well, good day again, everybody. It's uh, Philip Shields. Please be turning to Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, verse 3, it says, God inhabits or is enthroned in our praises. And if so, what kind of throne of praises are we providing him? Why does God want praise? What keeps us from praising? This sermon is all about praising God and why it's so vital in our worship. What will God do in return as we praise him? Be forewarned, this is not just another sermon on praise. I hope so, anyway. I hope that uh, your status quo will be challenged. So let's dive into it. Our last two studies on the Tabernacle of David, frankly, blew me away. This is not a part three. It's a whole totally different subject. But it was very much influenced by what we learned in the first two uh, sermons there about the Tabernacle of David. And if any of you haven't heard that sermon series, I would recommend that you go back and hear them. Uh, They were new to me. I was shocked that I hadn't seen before that David put the ark in a different tabernacle than the one Moses had built that was now in Gibeon. David placed the ark in a new tent he had made for it in Mount Zion. So again, please go back and hear hear those because I think the, the implications for the tabernacle of David from the tabernacle of David may be profound. And if you want to learn more, there is an exhaustive book on the subject I found after I delivered the sermons, which I'd had it before, titled The Tabernacle of David by Kevin J. Connor, C-O-N-N-E-R. I do recommend his book. You may find it interesting, as I did. The study was also eye-opening to me on another front, and that is that the Tabernacle of David was twofold. It was about the house of David, the genealogical line that God was going to build for David, but it was also very much about the literal tent on Mount Zion, where non-stop, around-the-clock worship was going on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as I pointed out in those two sermons. And it was erected specifically for the Ark of God. Uh, whereas the other Ark, I mean, the other tabernacle over in Gibeon was arkless. There was no Ark in the Holy of Holies there. And um, anyway, this particular tabernacle of David incorporated passionate praise, singing, clapping, orchestras, trumpets, sometimes I guess once in a while, even dancing, according to some of the Psalms. It's amazing to me. It was a type of the New Covenant times when James practically said as much in Acts 15. I think David understood, uh, or was allowed to understand some New Covenant concepts. David offered animal sacrifices at the beginning and the end of his journey of bringing up the ark to his new tabernacle. But it appears that once the ark was placed inside, that it appears to me anyway that very likely uh, David offered only sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving from then on, from that tabernacle anyway, as we'll read. The animal sacrifices did continue, however, over at Moses' tabernacle at Gibeon. Anyway, I learned from the study that I hadn't been praising God nearly enough. And that's beginning to change for me, and I hope that this study sermon will help it change for you. It did make me stop and wonder, what would David think of our church services today? And if we could be taken back in a time machine and be like a fly on a wall, just watching David in particular as he would worship, what would we think of King David's worship services, of his church services? What would he be doing? Again, in Psalm 22 and verse 3, Psalm 22 and verse 3, You are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. The King James Version says God inhabits the praises of Israel. The New Living Translation says God is surrounded by his people's praises. Is that true for you? Is God enthroned in your praises? Are we providing God a throne to be enthroned in by our praises? It certainly was true for the shepherd king and prophet David. If God is enthroned in our praises, what kind of throne have we built? How grand of a throne is it? Brethren, this is Philip Shields with a follow-up on that tabernacle of David. We're going to talk about praising God. I hope you will uh, really think about what we cover today. I have to confess one reason I'm giving this sermon is that I've come to see I don't praise enough. And I've had a lot of study and prayer, and I've sought God's word on it. And what you're going to hear today is what God's Word says. It may not always square with what you've practiced up until now. I'll predict 
that unless you're a self-righteous lady seeing, you may, like me, have to admit you don't do nearly enough praising. So I hope you'll find it motivating for you to get on, the, on track for that. There are tremendous benefits from learning to praise, as I hope you'll find out soon. This topic is for all ages. If you're 7 or 77, if you're 8 or 88, it doesn't matter. I hope you're going to pay attention because even children can learn very at a very early age and teenagers can learn at a very early age how to praise God. You're going to hear some things that are going to be new to you, but I ask you to please uh, see the fact that I'm reading these from Scripture and that I'm not just trying to uh, give some idea of my own, but I'm reading Scripture. And Jesus said we are to live by every word of God. And so uh, if that's the case, then uh, we're going to have to uh, decide if we're going to obey these verses or not. If after the sermon you still wonder how to praise God, let me know, and we can talk about it, or I can email you back and forth and so on. Uh, but I will say this. I believe very firmly that when we know that we know God, and when we have a very deep and a loving relationship with God, when we're talking to God and praying to God and in close communion with God, I believe that praise will bubble out of us as it did for David. It's when we're not so close to God, when we are not seeking the kingdom of God first, when we're getting busy perhaps even with church things. We're so busy doing things for God that we forget God like a husband or a family man or a father who is so busy providing for his family he doesn't take time to just hang out with the family. And I've had to learn that myself so many times. We'll also find it hardest to praise. What keeps us from praising God? We'll find it hardest to praise when we're distant from God. The corollary to what I just said. What makes us distant? Sin will separate us and keep us from bubbling up praises to God when we're feeling guilty or we're feeling distant. Another thing that will keep us from praising God is being preoccupied with the stuff of life instead of seeking God first. Another thing is keeping or confusing religion with worship. Religion is not worship. Religion is not what God seeks. God seeks a relationship, not just mechanics of religion, of going to church and all that. That will keep you from praising God. Most of all, not knowing God as a God who is a provident God, a God who provides and cares for you in all aspects of your life, not being aware of that will keep you from praising God. So it's certainly easier to praise God when everything's going well for us, you know, but even in our trials, as you'll see soon, as we get into it, you're going to learn to, we can praise that, that we can learn to praise most effectively by focusing on who God is, and more so on who God is than on what He could do for us. We also praise God for what He does for us, but God does what He does because of what He is. Now, I want to ask you this: Did you know? that the first tribe that God chose, you can read that in Judges chapter 1, the first three verses. The first tribe that God chose, Judges chapter 1, to lead the final battles into the promised land west of the Jordan after Joshua died, was Judah. They actually went to God and said, which tribe should be the first to go in? And God said, Judah. Now guess what Judah means. I want you to think about this in terms of us going into our promised lands and the battles we have to face before we go into the promised land that we have, the heavenly Mount Zion and all of that, and the wonderful kingdom of God that's going to be set up here on earth. God said Judah goes in first. Now Judah means, if you translate it into English, Yehuda or Judah means may God be praised. Judah means God be praised. Judah was the most populous of all the tribes. When they went into Egypt, they only had three sons uh, from Judah. And when they came out of Egypt, Judah had 74,000 males. Judah was the main tribe on the east gate of the court of the tabernacle, the entrance along with its green standard and the lion insignia as the lion of Judah. But the point I'm making is that praises to God, Yehuda Judah, was what led the nation of Israel into the promised land. 
Now ponder that. Paul says in Romans 2.29 that we are now spiritual Jews if we've been circumcised in our heart by God's Spirit. But what's a spiritual Jew? It literally translates to meaning a spiritual praiser of God. Someone who spiritually is a praiser of God. That's what you literally are if you're converted. Or are you? And am I a praiser? And that's what a spiritual Jew literally means. So that's what being a spiritual Jew okay, means. God calls things what they are or will be or should be. Now, according to 1 Peter 2.9, a very well-known verse, that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, his own special people, for what purpose? Do you remember the rest of the verse? It seems to me like I've heard many, many sermons that where the first part of that verse is emphasized, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. But for what purpose? It says to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's frankly time we start doing that. Now please be turning with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I'm frankly repenting of being so involved in religion in the past and not in real worshiping and praising. Things I picked up from the study on the tabernacle of David. And of course we've been talking about prayer and worship and praise as uh, most of my last few sermons. Now let's look at a practical application of the first thing going into victory being praise. And I want you to think about any battles you have spiritually, that instead of worrying and fussing over the trials we have, or if you're upset about your marriage, or if you're upset about your finances or your health, put praising out there first. And watch what happens here in Second Chronicles 20. Uh, you can start in verse 1. We're going to go to the verse 22 or so. It happened after this to the people of Moab with the people of Ammon. This is 2 Chronicles 20. And others with them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. This was the king of Judah. And then some came and told him, Hey, a great big group of people coming here to fight us. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat feared. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3. Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself to seek the eternal. Now, it's okay to fear, as long as you don't stay in the fear. But in the fear, go and seek God. As I said in the series I gave on living by faith, as he did here. Fear is a natural human reaction. And so he set himself to seek the eternal, and he proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Now Jehoshaphat prays to God in front of the people, and that's verses 5 through 11. And then verse 12, he ends by saying, O our God... Will you not judge them, for we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. There's a great verse in Isaiah that says, Great peace have they, whose minds are stayed on you. And that's what Jehoshaphat was trying to do. Now verse 13, Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children, stood before the Eternal. And then... Notice this, here's Jehoshaphat praying, and God's Spirit comes upon one of the descendants of Asaph, the Asaphites, we're going we're to read about Asaph, he was, he was one of the choir directors, one of the music directors that, you, that David used, a Levite. Anyway, he comes upon this, uh, this uh, Levite, Jehaziel, I'm in verse 14, and uh, he says in verse 15, Listen, all of you Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Eternal to you. That doesn't say he's a prophet. It just says that he's a Levite. But imagine that today. If the minister, <laughs> the pastor is praying, or the king is praying, and one of the church members comes up and says, Hey, everybody, I got a word from God. Listen. And you too, King, listen. (laughs) Can you imagine that happening today? Would our meetings allow such freedom for someone to jump in like that? Someone who had the guts to express what God's Spirit had moved him to say in a very sobering and scary time. I hope you'll learn from it. Someday you and I may be called to be a Jehaziel. Anyway, he says in verse 15, Thus says the Eternal to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed. 
because of the great multitude. The battle isn't yours, but God's. Tomorrow, leave the city. Go outside the, the, the walls that protect you and go out and face them, he says. Okay, you can read, keep reading yourself here. You're not going to have to fight, he says in verse 17. But tomorrow, go out there because the Lord is with you. So Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants bowed before the Lord, worshiping God. And then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites, okay, and the children of the Korahites, the descendants of Korah, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. Now I want you to notice that many, many times when it talks about praising God, it's not some little whisper. It's with voices loud and high. And there are times to stand up for God and start praising. It doesn't say here that anybody had them doing it. They just said they started doing it. They stood up. Time to praise. So they rose early in the morning. They went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat says, Believe in God and you'll be established. Believe his prophets. And then he talks to the people. Isn't that a cool thing? Verse 21, And he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. And they were saying, Praise the Eternal, which means hallelujah, or it's what hallelujah means, I mean. Hallelujah! Praise the Eternal, for his mercy endures forever. Now here's the exciting part. But verse 21, I want you to catch what's going on here. Jehoshaphat stops everybody and he says, look, I think something's wrong here. We got the soldiers out front. Let's put the praisers out front. Remember, Judah means praises of God. Remember, Judah was the first tribe in. Let's put the praisers out front. And they start singing, praise the eternal for his mercy never fails. His mercy endures forever. And when they began, verse 22, when they began to praise... The Eternal set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, and they were defeated. Did you catch that? When they began to sing and praise, God acted. I want to ask you, how much dramatic action are we as God's people missing out on because we're not praising enough, because we don't start with praise? Are we limiting the Holy One of Israel? This is what God's people should be doing. We are spiritual Israel, spiritual better than that Jews, which means praisers. David was trying to duplicate when he made that tabernacle, back to the tabernacle of David for a second, I'm sure he was trying to duplicate what he was revealed was going on in heaven, round the clock praising. And you can, in my transcript, I have a lot of scriptures there in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. And in Psalm 18, he says, I will call upon the Eternal who is worthy to be praised. And anyway, David just wanted to praise God, and Jehoshaphat had learned this. So that's what he does with the people that he sends out there as he's, as he's leading the people out there to see how God's going to give them a victory. I wonder how much faith we would have had if we would have left the security of the city because some Levite tells us, that that's what we should do. Now, I love the way David even prompts God in Psalm 65, verse 1. Psalm 65, verse 1. I just love this. Brethren, we have come to heavenly Mount Zion, and we can tell God that we have praises waiting for him. I love the way he puts it here in Psalm 65, verse 1. Praise is waiting for you, O God, in Zion. It's waiting for you. I can hardly wait, God. Okay? Okay. I'm so stoked from reading the Psalms in preparation for this sermon. There's just so much about praise in, in the book of Psalms, so much from David especially. God loves praises. And now let's read a few verses that reveal how much praising we should be doing. Psalm 34, verse 1. I'm going to read these quickly for time's sake. You can just jot them down, look them later, or, or you can pause the tape or whatever works for you. Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Man, I can't say that. Can you? Continually be in my mouth. 
Psalm 113, verse 3, from the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name, the Lord's name, I want you to hear that, because we're going to talk about that in a minute, the Lord's name is to be praised. And Psalm 71, that last one is Psalm 113, 3. Psalm 113, 3. And then Psalm 71, Psalm 71, 71, verse 8. Psalm 71, verse 8. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your honor all the day. Now, are we getting the idea? Remember that Paul says that uh, in, in Hebrews 13, 15, Paul says, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. Continually. Now, here's the point, brethren. Once you are something, you are that something, aren't you? Once you're a boy, you're a boy. Once you're a girl, you're a girl. Now, once you're a spiritual Jew, you're a spiritual Jew. Remember, David set up praising 24 hours a day, seven days a week in his tabernacle that he built. We are now spiritual Jews. A spiritual Jew means a praiser of God. That means as long as I breathe, I'm on duty. I'm on call to be praising God. I'm not a part-time spiritual Jew. I'm not a part-time praiser. I am never to forget I am a praiser. So whether you're 7 or 77, praising is what you are. That's what you're called to do. That's what the name means. Judah, you're a spiritual Jew. Look at Psalm, I mean Isaiah 60, verse 18. Isaiah 6, 0, verse 18. Isaiah 60, verse 18. When you go through a defensive wall around a city, to get into the city through the wall, what do you have to go through? It's called a gate, isn't it? Now, this passage I'm about to read to you is a prophecy about when God restores his blessings and presence. At, but at the end of Isaiah 60, verse 18, it says, But you shall call your wall salvation and your gates praise. And again, I just wanted you to see that, that we come into God's presence through a gate. And that gate is the gate called praise. I want you to really, really get this. You are a spiritual Jew on duty all the time. The Jews were the first to go into the promised land, the praisers. Jehoshaphat put the praisers in front for the victory. All right? David had praising going on 24 hours a day. And we enter his gates of praise. Isaiah 60, verse 18. Psalm 114, verse 1 and 2. Once again, we enter God's presence through praising. And even in tough times, we must be praising. 24-7, we're Jews all the time. Spiritual Jews all the time. Psalm 114, verse 1 and 2. When Israel went out of Egypt. When Israel out of Egypt went. The house of Jacob from a people of strange language. Isaiah, uh, Psalm, Psalm 114, verse 2. Judah, praise, that's what it means, became his sanctuary and Israel, his dominion. Now, we read right through that. I think it's nice poetry, but listen to me. There's something here that's deeper than that. What did we just read? He says, all Israel is God's dominion. But where is God's sanctuary? Where is his holy place, his special place? His sanctuary is his holy place. And he says, Judah is my sanctuary. Praising, praises is where I hang out. In fact, we started with that, didn't we, in Psalm 22, that I'm enthroned in the praises of Israel, God says. Now remember, you're a spiritual Jew if you're praising. Otherwise, if you're just a spiritual Israelite. Now remember, all Jews were also Israelites. And you are acknowledging God's dominion over you. Jesus is Lord. That's what it says here, Israel, his dominion. You're saying, God, yes, you have dominion over me. But have you become close enough to God to where going past the point of God's dominion over you, you have entered into His Holy of Holies, into His sanctuary, through the gates of praise. Psalm 114, verse 2, Judah, praise becomes His sanctuary. Brethren, hear it. 
Hear it. It's there. Psalm 76 and verse 1 is another one. This is a psalm of Asaph, one of the special praisers that David appointed to orchestrate. A round-the-clock praise. Remember, Gibeon's tabernacle had an empty Holy of Holies where they had formal, polite, proper worship, propers in quotes here in my mind, you know, the more formal type of worship going on. And here in Psalm 76, verse 1 and 2, In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. Okay, in, in Judah, God is known. In Israel, His name is great. Now, you can know God. Uh, you can know that God's name is great. But if you want to really know God, it's going to be through praising is what I hear here. We are the Israel of God, it says in Galatians. Galatians 6, I think, 6.16, 6, uh, 6, if I remember right. We are the Israel of God. And uh, But what makes uh, God's name great, and those who know God within the church are the praisers, is what I read here, Psalm 76, verse 1 and 2. I'm just trying to get some verses out that may maybe we just read over before. Psalm 76, 1 and 2. You and I cannot know God until we start praising regardless of anything else going on. And as we praise, as we get to know God, praising becomes easier and easier until it bubbles up out of us. God loves praises. He inhabits it. He surrounds himself with it. And he knows that we need to praise him for our good, and that's why he demands it. Just like a father training his children will demand the children say thank you when he does something for them. Not because the father needs it, but because the children need it. In the same way here, God will be almighty, God will be holy, God will be great. God will be everything God is, whether you praise him or not. But in your praising, we get to know God better, and it puts everything in perspective. Okay, what is praise? I want to start with a Bible definition before going into man's definitions and dictionaries. I don't know why people do that sometimes. They go into a dictionary definition instead of a Bible one. Hebrews 13, verse 15 gives us a definition of praise. It's not the only one, but it's a big one. Hebrews 13, verse 15. And praise, according to this, is largely about giving thanks. But not just giving thanks, but giving thanks to God's name. And it's not just giving thanks. It's giving thanks, I'm going to say it again, to his name. Hebrews, and we're going to talk about that for a second. Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him, by Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice. I want you to notice that phrase too. A sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That's the definition of praise. Praise is when we're giving thanks to God and giving thanks to his name according to this one here. And there's many other definitions of, by its usage in the Bible. Praise also does include the dictionary meanings of to applaud or to commend, to compliment, to glorify. All this is in my transcript if you want the exact word for word, uh, or at least as close to it. I sometimes get away from my notes, uh, as I'm doing right now. But applaud, commend, compliment, glorify, extol, magnify, admire, express approval of, all of these is part of praising. Now, Hebrews 13 says you give thanks to his name. Remember that God's name tells us who God is. I have a sermon on the website about our prophetic new names. I hope you'll have time to go back and read it and hear it. I understand another website has used much of that same material, but that's good. Hey, we, we all plagiarize God, I guess. But in Psalm 1849, Psalm 1849, it also says we sing praises to your name. Psalm 1849, we sing praises to your name. Psalm 149.3 says, let them praise his name with a dance. I want you to remember it says dances right here. Psalm 149.3, that those of you who like to dance and have, and have a dance ability, uh, there are times that even David, remember, danced in his praising before God. And he not only danced, it says he danced with all his might before the eternal. Now, God's names tell us who and what God is. And someday maybe it's worthy of a whole sermon. But for example, when Hagar felt all alone when she was cast out by Sarah and she was going to die of thirst, she and Ishmael, and she prays to God and, and God answers her. I think she prayed in that example. 
in Genesis 16. But anyway, she turns around and sees this bubbling brook of water. And then she reveals a name of God at that point. And as the God who sees, she understands God as the God who, after all, does see. Even though I thought I was all alone out here in the desert, I'm about ready to die. My son and I can't go on much longer. But the God who sees saw this the whole time. So we praise his name, for example. We can praise him for being a God who sees us all the time, no matter where we are. We cannot go out of his sight. We cannot be out of his uh, uh, awareness. In Genesis 22, when, when, uh, when Abraham was uh, going to just about sacrifice Isaac there, God provided an innocent ram as a substitute, a ram caught by his shofar, the, the horns. Remember, the shofar was what they blew to announce the liberty. And this gave certainly Abraham liberty. It gives us liberty. It was a picture of Jesus Christ. At that particular moment, Abraham says, Aha! Uh -huh. This is the eternal will provide another name. The eternal will provide. And so God is a provident God. So when we praise God, we can come before God and say, God in heaven, I thank you and we worship you and we praise you. That no matter how alone I feel, I'm not alone. You're always there with me. No matter how forsaken by man I feel, and boy, sometimes I do feel that way. I don't have to feel that way because you are there with me. And when I feel like I'm really stuck, the eternal will provide. Thank you for being the eternal who provides. You see what I'm saying? So we do what we do because of what we are. And God does what God does because of what God is. And now we're part of that kingdom of God where we are going to, we are begotten into that kingdom of God, certainly now. But my point is, in Christ we're no longer what we were. We are now children of God, a prince or princess of that kingdom, a child of God the highest. We can praise God by all of that. And the process of becoming like God is itself a painful one, Paul talked about, he says, I labor, I think that's in Galatians 4, Galatians 4.19. He says, I labor in like a woman in travail for the, the church brethren. He says, until Christ is formed in you. Now, you and I look at ourselves and others and we get real discouraged when we see there's a long way to go. But my point is the God who starts everything also finishes everything and we can thank God that He is that kind of God also. You've started something in me. You're going to finish something in me. Thank you, O God. Wow. You know, we can come before God, and praise puts us back in the winner's court. The God who provides praise reminds us of who's in our camp with us, who's watching our back. Now, let's move on. So you're praising God's name you're, means you're praising who God is. It means you're praising Him for what He is. Now, praise is not silent. Praise is not done in secret. I want you to really get this. It can't be something you just keep in your heart. Do you think that Jehoshaphat's praisers, as he and the Israel, Israelites, the Jews, stepped outside the city walls to face the invaders, do you think the praisers were just having good thoughts? You think they were just praying in their mind's eye or whispering or in their mind? The Bible speaks over and over and over again about lifting up our voices in praise. Praises were often sung. They were sometimes shouted. They were often spoken. But praises were out there. They were loud. They were audible. Praise has to be something that can either be seen or heard as you'll see as we go through. <clears throat> and remember also the verse we just read, where, um, in fact, when Jehaziel announced that here's what God wants, the Korahites and the Kohathites, man, they just started praising, stood up and started praising. I love that. Okay, now, 
Continuing, in Psalm 69, verse 30, Psalm 69, verse 30, I will praise the name of God, here again the name, meaning what God is, who he is, with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Magnify God. And then in Psalm 147, 7, just write these down because i got to catch up some time here. Sing praises on the harp. <coughs> Sing praises. Psalm 95, verse 2. 95, verse 2. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Now watch this. Psalm 95, 2. And let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Shout joyfully to him with psalms. Are you getting the point? Praise is expressed by either sound or action. Psalm 47, verses 1 and 2. Are you ready for this one? Now this is the only verse I know of that says this, but it does have it as a verse in the Bible. Psalm 47, verses 1 and 2. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Now there are verses that talk about nature will clap their hands when God delivers them from what was what's happening around around nature, you know, the bad things that are happening. But here it says, for people, clap your hands, all you people, shout to God. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. Yay! You know, shout to God. Hooray! Praise God! You know, for the Lord Most High is awesome. Now, brethren, here's, here's what I want to get, get at. Why, oh, why are our church services, for the most part, so dead, so dull, so void of any celebration of our king? Sure, we have our singing. And we kind of sing through the motions. And we have our prayer, and everybody else is quiet. And, and then we have the one man speaking. Everyone's quiet and listening. And then we have some more songs. And then we all kind of go home. I don't think that's what David's services were like. That was the point of the last two tasks. That has changed my life. Why are our services so dull? So void of any celebration of our king, our victor, our conqueror, our champion, our triumphant God. He's our champion. And let's remember we're 24-7, 24, 24 hour a day, 7 day a week spiritual praisers. And this we should be carrying over into our private lives. Now because many of us were raised to be hushed and solemn and proper inside a church building, and some churches don't even allow musical instruments. So many of us have carried that over now into our worship today and our praising today without testing that philosophy we grew up with against the words of God himself. Again, I say, if we could go back to David's tabernacle during the 24-hour, round-the-clock, seven days a week worshiping, we'd be blown away! Blown away! By the energy and the excitement, the volume, the activity and the atmosphere of celebrating God. As well, I'm sure, of times of devout, quiet, your face on the ground worshiping going on as well. We'd hear harps, tambourines, timbrels, flutes, trumpets. Oh, lots of trumpets. Singing, occasional clapping, and even occasional dancing in their worship. Now, if some of you are thinking I've gone holy roller on you or something. Hey, listen, please listen. I'm struggling with these same verses as you are. But either we live by every word of God as Jesus tells us in Matthew 4, 4, or we cut them out of the Bible and walk away from the way God says he wants to be worshipped. You go to a ball game, you go to a little league game, let alone a big ball game or a Super Bowl or something like that, You've cheered, you've clapped, you've jumped to your feet, you've rejoiced, you've done it all in ball games. If, you're, if your son hits a home run or your daughter hits a winning goal on the soccer team, have you not ever shouted joyfully? Have we done that for our Savior? Ever? David and Asaph sure did. Others sure did. They shouted joyfully. But try that in your church sometime. See how far you get. Please be turning to Psalm 100. Question, how comfortable would we be watching our king, our husband David, whom the Bible says had a heart like God's? That tells me Jesus is like this. How 
How comfortable comfortable would we be would we be watching our king, our husband, shout, sing, play, dance, whirl, twirl, it says in the Bible, with all his might, and cheer God on in the presence of the ark as it was coming to Mount Zion and to David's tabernacle. I want it to sink in, brethren. David praised God with a dance, singing and shouting, playing the harp and his praising. Would you and I have been like Michael? I think the honest answer is many of us would be. And if we are like Michael, we could, like Michael, be made unfruitful. Brethren, we better wake up while we can. What I am teaching you is not holy roller. What I am teaching you is not Pentecostal. What I am teaching you is not anything but what the Bible says David did and Asaph did. You're going to hear a whole lot more as we go through. And I am going to do what God says to do, and I'm not going to worry about what man thinks going forward. Psalm 100, verse 1, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Make a joyful shout. It says in the book of Ezra that when they laid the foundation of the new temple, that the shouting of the people who were and the praising of God was so loud that some of the old men were crying because they, they remembered how majestic the old foundation was. But it says the shouting and praising couldn't be told from the... And it could be heard miles away. <laughs> These Jews know how to praise. Come before his presence with singing. Psalm, 70, Psalm 47, verse 5 and 6. Psalm 47, verse 5 and 6. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Imagine bringing trumpets to your church services. <laughs> we used to have a man from France who'd come in with us when we had these uh, Feast of Tabernacles meetings and he'd bring his trumpet. And that was cool. It was really good. Sing praises to God. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. I mean, <laughs> the way it's worded here, you can almost see David saying, come on, sing, come on, sing some more. Now, sometimes I've heard people say, why do we have to have all this special music and all the time the choir takes up and, and uh, the soloists and all that, we could have had more sermon time. Uh, brethren, maybe you don't like to sing or don't know how to sing or can't sing yourself and uh, keep yourself on key or whatever, but if God's given certain people talent to do that, God enjoys music, and that's part of the worship service as much as the sermon is. There have been times that I got more out of the choir music than I did the sermon. There were times I got more out of the words that were being sung than I got out of the sermon. The song service is a part of the ministry of that person who is giving it, I don't whether ordained or not, it is a ministry. Psalm 86, verse 12. So praise, brethren, Psalm 86, 12. Praise is speaking out your adoration, singing out your adoration, your respect, your gratitude, your thanksgiving. Praise is not silent. <clears throat> In fact, we're supposed to praise with all our heart, just as David danced before the Eternal with all his heart. Psalm 86, 12, I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. Psalm 86, 12, I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. Brethren, don't fight the words God himself gives us here. Gives us here. Live by every word of God. We're to put our hearts into praising God. So start by audibly praising God for what God is. Now, for example, in your praising, as you pray, you can say, we praise you, our Father, for being a holy God of love. We praise you and thank you for your unending mercies. Your mercy never fails. We praise you for your unfailing devotion and loyalty. We praise you, Jesus, for being so accepting of us repentant creatures who fall so far short of you and your glory. Okay, the tape has just turned over, so I'm going to take a little time here. Just wait for it to catch up a little bit. So here again, when you when you 
when we start to praise God, <clears throat> when we start to praise God, let's do it audibly. Let's do it in a way that, that as we read there in Psalm 86, I don't know if this got on tape. So Psalm 86, verse 12, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. And I will glorify your name forevermore. Psalm 86, 12. And so when we praise God, we come before him and we just start thanking him for who and what he is. I give an example of that in the transcript. And then it very naturally follows from there to thank and praise him for not only what he is, but what he's done because of what he is. He does what he does. So we praise you and we thank you that because of your love, you gave your only son to come and live and die for me and for all of us that we may be forgiven we praise you for forgiving us of all of our sins and for us missing the mark. We praise you for the healings you give us, the wonderful world you've created us to live in. We praise you for the wonderful creation that I can enjoy. We praise you, Jesus, for interceding for us day and night and defending us as our advocate against the accuser. You see the difference in the natural progression? You start with praise and adoration for who God is his love, his mercy, his never failing kindnesses, the fact he's always there seen, and then you progress from there to what he what he does. So what I'm about to preach now is not going to be very comfortable, <laughs> uh, but let's go on and see what it says. <clears throat> now praise can include thanking God, of course, both for good times and bad times. Look at Ephesians 5. Please turn there with me. Ephesians 5, verses 18 to 20. Ephesians 5, verses 18 to 20. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, verses 18 to 20. Don't be drunk with wine, he says, but come together with psalms and spiritual songs. And verse 20 is what I want to concentrate on. Ephesians 5, 20. Giving thanks always for all things. You always give thanks for everything. Now, you don't necessarily thank God for the car accident, and yet you can. You can. And you can thank God for the car accident by, or, the, or the cancer or whatever it is by saying, God, I thank you that in this cancer, in this car accident, you are there. You see this. And you are working in ways I don't see. And I'm never out of your sight <clears throat> for all things, good and bad. All means everything. Philippians 4, verse 6, Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 says that in everything we give thanks and let our requests be made known to God so the peace of God which suppresses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds as it goes on to say. But my point is Ephesians 5 says for all things. Philippians 4, verse 6 says in everything we thank God. Now, remember we read earlier in Hebrews thirteen fifteen that God says that we offer the sacrifice of praise. The sacrifice of praise. Sacrificing is hard. Sacrifices cost you something. Sacrifices are personal. Sacrifices don't always feel good. <clears throat> Sometimes it's frankly hard to praise, to be grateful, when it seems so bad all around you. But in Psalm 107 and verse 22, just jot it down. Psalm 107, 22, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. And Psalm 27, verse 6, he's wrong the transcript. Psalm 27, verse 6, he says, I will offer the sacrifices of joy in his tabernacles tabernacle i mean i will sing yes i will sing praises to the eternal so it talks about sacrifices of joy sacrifices of thanksgiving you'll remember too that david seems to understand that god is not particularly looking for blood of bulls and goats do you remember when he repented in psalm 51 what he says psalm 51 he says you're not interested in sacrifices or I'd bring it to you. But a poor and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Psalm 51. David calls it sacrifices of joy elsewhere. And that's what typified the tabernacle of David. 
Now, sometimes you just don't feel like praising. If you go with me to Psalm 42 and also Psalm 43, and just start reading it while I'm talking here, Psalm 42 and 43, notice what we're taught in Scripture. The, the descendants of Korah here wrote an awesome psalm, and really I think this was probably one continuous psalm, <clears throat> Psalm 42 and 43, because the wording is almost identical. We can learn from them. I'm going to read it today from the today's English version. Psalm 42, verse 1 to 5. As a deer longs for a stream of cool water, so I long for you, O God. Psalm 42, verse 2 now. <clears throat> I thirst for you, the living God. When can I go and worship in your presence? Day and night I cry, and tears are my only food. All the time my enemies ask me, where is your God? My heart breaks when I remember the past, when I went with the crowds to the house of God and led them as we walked along, a happy crowd singing and shouting praises to God. Why am I so sad? Why am I so troubled? I will put my hope in God, and once again I will praise Him, my Savior and my God. And he says that again at the end of verse 11. Why am I so sad? I will hope in God. He says, I'm not there yet. This praising part during a severe trial, you've just lost a kid or you've, had, you've been told you have breast cancer or something. This praising bit's a little hard. But I will hope in God and once again I will praise Him. I think the New King James says, I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. I think the lesson from Psalm 42 and 43 to me is sometimes we don't feel like praising. Sometimes praising is awful hard when your wife has just died. And brethren, I've been unemployed, I've been fired, I've been financially broken at times, I've been deserted by people I thought were friends, I've lost my parents, my grandparents, a couple of very dear cousins, uncles and aunts, and most of all, years ago, our first son died. I know what I'm talking about. Praise is hard, hard at those times. But that's when praise or worship is most important, as Job did when his son died, or his children died, as David did after God took his son. So I hope we get the point. Praise is thanking God for what he is, for what he's doing, even the things we don't understand. And so when we can glorify God and say, Father, we will trust you, we're still at peace in you. We still believe you. We still know you will work all this out for good and to your glory. So, God, I'm crying my eyeballs out. God, I hurt like I hurt terribly inside. And yet I'm going to praise you even in this and for this, knowing that you are my provident God. You are the God who sees. You are the God who cares. So that's another way we can praise. What else is praise? Our changed lives can also be a, a way we can bring praising to God. Our changed lives, brethren. This is huge, what I'm about to say here. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Brethren, if people once knew you as a criminal, a poor husband, perhaps obnoxious or impatient or a drunkard, a sexual uh, deviant of some kind, a lazy person, sexually immoral person, and now they see that you are totally different, that you're a loving, wonderful, moral, godly person who is not like the things you used to be, that brings glory to God. That is a big way that we can praise God. And brethren, I want you to really, really get that and think about that because um, that's all in my notes. And I'm going I'm to skip over some of this point, but I want you to read it in my notes if you can. I think it's page 11. And then you can pray as our big brother Jesus did, Father, glorify your name in all the earth. And we can ask that and we can do that by the way we live, by the way we talk with others, by our changed life. I had a lady call me one time when I was pastoring a church up in Canada. And this lady says, my sister so-and-so attends your church. She's been attending now for about eight months. And she says, you don't know what my sister was like before she started attending, but I do. 
she was, and she started to describe her, and then very, very blunt, earthy words. And then she says, whatever you've done for my sister, I'd like you to do for me. And I just started laughing. I said, I haven't done anything for your sister. I'm just a lousy minister. But I'll tell you what, why don't you come to services, and we'll introduce you to what God can do for you, because that's what happened to your sister. She found God. And God lives in her now, and God is being formed. Christ is being formed in her, and that's why she's being changed. And, you know, sometimes I've been a hard-nosed businessman at times. Recently I've been asking Jesus to live more in me, to change me, so I can adorn the doctrine that I purportedly teach. Adorning the doctrine of God. Turn with me to Titus 2, verses 9 and 10. Titus 2, verses 9 and 10. You know the way we work, the way we act at work. Would people know, want to know the secret of what makes us so contented, so happy, so at peace, so honest? Or are you known as a worry wart and, and a hard-to-get-along-with person at work, but boy, at church, you're somebody different? You know, in Titus 2, verses 9 and 10, it's written actually to converted slaves. And Paul tells them here, inspired by God's Spirit, he says to act in such a way, he says, to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. I think you get the point. There's much more in my, in my, my, my transcript in this case. Even Paul says at the end of Galatians 1, that people who used to know him as a persecutor, he says at the end of Galatians 1, verse 23, but when they were hearing that he only per- he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. So yeah, we can praise God by a changed life that brings glory to God, and brethren, change we must. Now, as we learn to praise... Let's be willing to do all that God says to do. I'm going to keep going on some of these things that may be challenging to some of you. This may hit some of you wrong what I'm about to say. But it may not be what we at first will feel comfortable doing, but much of what God tells us is uncomfortable at first, whether it's Saturday Sabbath or whatever it is, not worshiping Him with pagan holidays that was uncomfortable in the, in the beginning, wasn't it? But now the same goes for praising God. We've always covered, already covered, how the inspired scripture says to praise Him with all our hearts as we sing and play musical instruments. Now, in Psalm 77, here's the other thing I want to get to now. Once in a while, be willing to do what scripture says in this one more area I'm about to cover. David did it and taught it. Asaph did it and taught it. Job did it. Ezra did it. Paul did it and taught it. What's this it I'm talking about? Moses also did it. Moses, Paul, Job, David, Asaph, Solomon. You know what I'm going to get at here? As you pray and praise, sometimes reach out your arms and your hands up to God in heaven as if you're wanting him to as we are the little child and he's the father and you want him to reach down and pick you up and, and hug you and, and hold him hold you close to him and protect you and hold you and be there for you. Psalm 77, verse 1 and 2. As you praise, there's verse after verse after verse after verse that says this. Psalm 77, verse 1 and 2. I cried out to God with my voice and he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. Psalm 77, verse 1 and 2. That was a psalm of Asaph, one of David's top Levite musicians who stood before the ark of God in the tabernacle of David. Asaph said that when he felt troubled, he reached out his arms to his holy father like a child reaching up to be hugged, like I said. I remember a time that my wife had hit a patch of ice. She had uh, Rachel and Heather with her in the in the car. And uh, Heather was particularly, I think she was no more than two and a half or three, maybe three, three and a half years old, something like that, at the time it happened, and was terrified because the van that my wife was driving, she hit this patchy patch of ice, ended up in the ditch with the kids in it. 
Anyway, I found out about it, and when I finally caught up with the kids and my wife, I saw Heather. <laughs> I saw Heather coming up to me with her arms outstretched. You could hardly wait for me to pick her up, kind of like protect me from. I'm, I kid my wife sometimes, but it's almost like she was saying, "Protect me from my mommy." You know, Daddy, Daddy, save me. But I mean, that picture came to mind as I was studying this. That picture, my little girl coming up and wanting Daddy to protect her and hold her and comfort her, because she was terrified. She probably doesn't even remember it, but lifting up holy arms is described as reaching out towards God, stretching out our arms towards God. And that's the picture I think of, that we're reaching out, God, hold me, take me, hug me, protect me. Nothing wrong with it, brethren. Scripture says to do it. It's not holy roller, Scripture says, to do it. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 8, I want you to turn there, please. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. Why wouldn't we do it if we're told to do it? Especially if we understand the picture behind it. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. I hope you're there now. I, Paul, he says, desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. As you pray, lift up your holy hands. Reach out to God. King Solomon, when he dedicated the temple that he had just built, he raises his arms in prayer and praise. And in 1 Kings 8.22 1 Kings 8.22, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. Some of you are worrying, oh no, praying with arms outstretched is somehow holy roller or disrespectful to God. Nothing could be further from the truth. When I saw Heather coming towards me as a little two and a half or three year old with her, with her hands out there outstretched, and and wanting me to hold her, I felt like a father. God sees us as little children, reaching up to him and wanting him to take our hand. He wants to swing us up to his chest in deep, assuring embrace. As father, that brings him great glory to know that you understand that, that you understand that. I don't think any of us would think of Ezra as a holy roller, would we? Not Ezra. (laughs) I sure don't. Turn to Ezra 9. Now watch this. Here's Ezra. He's repenting. And he's ashamed to even lift up his face. But he's repenting for the evils in the, in the nation. Ezra 9, verse 5 and 6. In the Old Testament, Ezra 9, verses 5 and 6. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting. Ezra 9, 5 and 6. And having torn my garment and my robe, I fell on my knees, and I spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, O my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have been higher than our heads. But notice what, this man was no holy roller. But he also spreads out his hands to the eternal, his God. Now you already know that Asaph and David surely did it. Uh, Psalm 28, Psalm 28, verse 2. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you. Psalm 28, verse 2. When I lift up my hands towards your holy sanctuary. When I lift up my hands. Now in my commentary... In my transcript, I give other verses. Psalm 63, verse 4. Psalm 134, verse 2. There there are many more. Do you want more? There are more. Just start studying what the Word says. How can it be wrong to lift up your hands to our Holy Father? Come on, brethren. Just because Pentecostals do it or some uh, Baptists may do it or whatever, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. Maybe we're the ones who are being too formal. Maybe we want to go over to the tabernacle of Gibeon that has no ark in it instead of learning the lesson of the tabernacle of David. Maybe we would be a Michael 
criticizing David. He has his arms lifted up and he's happy. He's singing and he's shouting and he's dancing. I know, maybe you're not ready for that. That's why I'm preaching it. A huge point of this is made in Exodus 17, that as long as Moses prayed for Israel during a battle with Amalek, turn there please, a very important passage. Please turn there. If, uh, Exodus 17, I'll wait for you there. Exodus 17. And Amalek, one of the warlike descendants of Esau, had come out to fight Israel, and Moses had asked Joshua to lead the army against them. God gave them a great victory. God was very pleased with this. And God, in fact, according to Josephus, not a single Israelite was killed. But at the same time, God made them promise that at, the, at some point they would uh, take retribution on Amalek for this. But my point is not all that. My point is this, Exodus 17, verse 10. Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. Now these are three brothers. Moses and Aaron are brothers. Her is the brother-in-law of Moses. Her is the husband of Miriam, according to Jewish tradition. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put him under it, put it under him, and he sat on it. And then Aaron and Hur, to me this is so moving when you understand it, supported his hands so that they could stay raised up, even, even when their brother was too tired to raise his hands. There are times we raise our brother's hands for him. There are times we lift up our brother and our sister to God in heaven when they can't do it because... The burden's too heavy. The trial's too deep. We do it for them. Aaron and Hur supported his hands. Exodus 17, verse 12 I'm reading. One on one side and the other on the other side. His hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. These were brothers, brethren. There are times when our brothers' arms may be too weary. But we, what we have to do is prop up our brother upon the rock that is Christ. Just as Aaron and Hur propped Moses up, they took a stone and put it under him. And that rock was Christ. And then we raise up our brother to God's throne for him and with him petitioning our God for our brother, raising his arms with ours as one before God. What an inspiring picture. If you were God, if you were a daddy, and you saw two brothers helping a tired other brother coming before you, wouldn't you be moved? There's a lesson there, brethren. You know there are times you just don't feel like praising, but you know you should. You know you have brothers and sisters in Christ who have times like that too. Call them. Ask them to help you. Lift your arms up. Your calling is to prop up your brother in their time of need and to ask for their help in your time of need. God blessed this battle with a great victory as long as prayer with raised arms was going on. Three brothers working together to do what it says right here. Do we want God with us, giving us victory? Then like Moses, let's pray and praise without ceasing, brethren. Pray and praise without ceasing. Without losing heart, lift your heart, arms up to God. I think that is so moving. <clears throat> I hope you will stop this nonsense about it being holy roller stuff. I know some of you are thinking that. Either that or take up your complaint with God who personally inspired every one of those verses I just read you. And many more I could read. Take your complaint up when you see them. With Moses and Ezra, Solomon, Asaph and David, and Paul, and so on. But don't accuse me that I'm teaching anything wrong here. 
Far from it. It's time we start obeying every word of God. And as Paul said, to lift up holy hands in prayer and praise. Some of you are thinking like Michael, David's wife, despising anything that smacks of passionate worship for God. Beware, brethren, lest like Michael you're also rejecting what God's teaching on this matter and become unfruitful. Some of us are, are willing, have to be willing to grow in understanding on these things and like one of the lessons from the tabernacle of David, get past doing and hearing the same old, same old. At least consider this, that those of you who wish to pray occasionally with raised hands do so. Have a group discussion about it perhaps if you meet with a group. And here's my suggestion. Try these things first privately, just between you and God in your own private prayer. Get used to doing it that way from time to time. I don't do it all the time. I do it once in a while. But if I meet with you or you meet with me in a small or large group, don't be surprised if you see me sometime raise my arms and hands in prayer. Maybe not. Maybe you won't see me do it that particular time, but maybe you would, you would some other time. You might see my arms outstretched to my heavenly Father. I'm his small child petitioning his Father's love and acceptance. I'm just a little wee little baby in God's eyes. And if you feel I've gone crazy with that, then you'll have to throw away the book of Psalms and other verses I've just read. I don't know what you're going to do with it. I think we need to evaluate, because it's not just Old Testament, it's New Testament too. Paul said it. I think we need to evaluate how we might be limiting the worship of God in some puny little set of rules someone decreed long ago because they were raised from the in the, I don't know, in, in a church that didn't do that. Maybe they were raised in a Quaker church or something. So many times we bring in our backgrounds, the way we were raised. Remember even in the New Testament, it talks about how there were those of the sect of the Pharisees who came into the church and they brought their problems with them. Their way of thinking, I'm sure many of them, like Paul, got over it. Paul certainly did. But we've got to be careful to understand what we're bringing into the church with us if it's not squaring with the Bible. Let's do what the Bible says. Now, I'm convinced that when we someday are in the same worship services with Paul and David and Ezra and Peter and others, we're going to watch worship and praise going on like we've never imagined. When we get together with everybody, you're going to see praise and worship go on in a way like you have never imagined. Please ponder what I'm saying. Or for that matter, if we can take a peek into what the 24 elders and the four living creatures do before the throne of the living God in heaven, maybe we'd understand why David did what David did 24-7 and why he had 24 sets of teams of Levites who did it, representing the 24 elders around the throne of God. David had unbounded joy. He even danced before God one time there as he praised. Danced. Confession number one. I've never done that. Ever. Confession number two. I may have, I may have been like Michael, criticizing David at first for his unbounded worship. Confession number three. I've repented of that awareness of where I am in the process. Confession number four, I'm trying out this idea of raising hands while praying and shouting my praises and singing my praises to God. Confession number five, it's not so bad. In fact, I'm beginning to like it. So you can find out that we can grow in these things, brethren. We're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Not stay the same. I have much, much more, but I'm almost out of time. Let me just quickly say this, that if you find praising hard, certainly as we sing hymns in church, we're praising. That's true. But it's more than that. Read the Psalms. Read the last 10 Psalms, especially Psalm 84 and Psalm 103 and the last 10 Psalms and so on. I would listen to good praise music. We bought some music and some of it we don't like. A lot of it we don't like. But we pick the ones we liked and we put them in a, in a way where we can listen to them. 
I'd say slow down. Ponder what God is doing in your life. Take some notes even. Write down some things as to what you see God teaching you and doing in your life. And I think the hurry up way of life we have is really blocking a lot of the things that God's doing, blocking us from seeing the things that God's doing. Look for God's glory and His creation. That's why I love my office. I look out in the woods here behind my house, see deer walk out there once in a while. And uh, look for God's glory in His creation at times when God's presence are clear. When God's presence, you know, those times, times to worship. When you see a healing take place, take time to glorify and praise God. Say it! When someone tells you they've been, pra- they've been healed, say it. Say, praise God. Praise the Eternal that you were healed. Say it. It says that when the healed leper, remember the Samaritan leper who was healed, the one out of ten, it says in Luke 17 that he came back to Jesus with a, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell at Jesus' feet worshiping. With a loud voice he glorified God. The, the man who was healed in Acts 4, I think it was, uh, or was it 3, you know, where he's he, the man who was a, a, a lame man. He was jumping up and down. How, how does all this end up, brethren? Okay, got to move here. Romans fourteen eleven says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall give praise. And there are many, many uh, psalms that prophesy that all nations, all creation will come and praise the eternal. Now, here's how it ends. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. In the end, if we love our God and praise His name and His works, guess what? You think you can outpraise God? Wait till you see what God has in store for you. <clears throat> God is going to praise you before the Father, before all the millions of holy angels, before the 24 elders, the four living creatures, and the seraphim, and the cherubim. And you're going to be bowled over when the King of Kings says some words of praise to you about you in front of everybody. Yes, it's coming. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. And boy, you read that last phrase, and reveal the counsels of the hearts. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5. And you think, "Uh uh-oh, I'm going to be in trouble then. But now read the rest of the story. Then each one's praise will come from God. Why haven't I heard that preached and preached and preached? In 1 Peter 1, verses 6 to 8, it talks about how the genuineness of our faith is going to be tried and tested, being much more precious than gold, until it be found to honor and praise and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Brethren, brethren, You are going to have a new name. You are going to be praised by God if you love God and His praises more than the praises of man. Until next time, brethren, this is Philip Shields encouraging you to praise God with all your being. Let's end with Psalm 150. If I run out of time, keep reading it yourself. But please pass the word to other people that they've got to start learning this. We are spiritual Jews, spiritual praisers. Psalm 150. There's coming a time when God will praise those who've spent their lives praising and focusing on Him and His glory. You're going to be blown away when you get the new name and hear all that God's going to say. In the meantime, though, in Psalm 150, praise the Eternal, praise God in His sanctuary. We're the sanctuary of God, we're His temple. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to or because of His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and the harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with clashing cymbals. Imagine that. 
Let everything that has breath praise the eternal. Praise the eternal. Can we say it together? The burden's too heavy. The trial's too deep. We do it for them. Aaron and Hur supported his hands. Exodus 17, verse 12 I'm reading. One on one side and the other on the other side. His hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. These were brothers, brethren. There are times when our brothers' arms may be too weary. But we, what we have to do is prop up our brother upon the rock that is Christ. Just as Aaron and Hur propped Moses up, they took a stone and put it under him. And that rock was Christ. And then we raise up our brother to God's throne for him and with him petitioning our God for our brother, raising his arms with ours as one before God. What an inspiring picture. If you were God, if you were a daddy, and you saw two brothers helping a tired other brother coming before you, wouldn't you be moved? There's a lesson there, brethren. You know there are times you just don't feel like praising, but you know you should. You know you have brothers and sisters in Christ who have times like that too. Call them. Ask them to help you. Lift your arms up. Your calling is to prop up your brother in their time of need and to ask for their help in your time of need. God blessed this battle with a great victory as long as prayer with raised arms was going on. Three brothers working together to do what it says right here. Do we want God with us, giving us victory? Then like Moses, let's pray and praise without ceasing, brethren. Pray and praise without ceasing. Without losing heart, lift your heart arms up to God. I think that is so moving. <clears throat> I hope you will stop this nonsense about it being holy roller stuff. I know some of you are thinking that. Either that or take up your complaint with God who personally inspired every one of those verses I just read you. And many more I could read. Take your complaint up when you see them with Moses and Ezra, Solomon, Asaph and David and Paul and so on. But don't accuse me that I'm teaching anything wrong here. Far from it. It's time we start obeying every word of God. And as Paul said, to lift up holy hands in prayer and praise. Some of you are thinking like Michael, David's wife, despising anything that smacks of passionate worship for God. Beware, brethren, lest like Michael you're also rejecting what God's teaching on this matter and become unfruitful. Some of us are, are willing, have to be willing to grow in understanding on these things and like one of the lessons from the tabernacle of David, get past doing and hearing the same old, same old. At least consider this. Let those of you who wish to pray occasionally with raised hands do so. Have a group discussion about it, perhaps, if you meet with a group. And here's my suggestion. Try these things first privately, just between you and God in your own private prayer. Get used to doing it that way from time to time. I don't do it all the time. I do it once in a while. But if I meet with you or you meet with me in a small or large group, don't be surprised if you see me sometime raise my arms and hands in prayer. Maybe not. Maybe you won't see me do it that particular time, but maybe you would, you would some other time. You might see my arms outstretched to my Heavenly Father. I'm a small child petitioning His Father's love and acceptance. I'm just a little, wee little baby in God's eyes. And if you feel I've gone crazy with that, then you'll have to throw away the book of Psalms and other verses I've just read. I don't know what you're going to do with it. I think we need to evaluate, because it's not just Old Testament, it's New Testament too. Paul said it. I think we need to evaluate how we might be limiting the worship of God in some puny little set of rules someone decreed long ago because they were raised from the in the, I don't know, in, in a church that didn't do that. Maybe they were raised in a Quaker church or something. So many times we bring in our backgrounds, the way we were raised. Remember even in the New Testament, 
it talks about how there were those of the sect of the Pharisees who came into the church and they brought their problems with them. Their way of thinking, I'm sure many of them, like Paul, got over it. Paul certainly did. But we got to be careful to understand what we're bringing into the church with us if it's not squaring with the Bible. Let's do what the Bible says. Now, I'm convinced that when we someday are in the same worship services with Paul and David and Ezra and Peter and others, we're going to watch worship and praise going on like we've never imagined. When we get together with everybody, you're going to see praise and worship go on in a way like you have never imagined. Please ponder what I'm saying. Or for that matter, if we can take a peek into what the 24 elders and the four living creatures do before the throne of the living God in heaven. Maybe we'd understand why David did what David did 24-7 and why he had 24 sets of teams of Levites who did it, representing the 24 elders around the throne of God. And David had unbounded joy he even danced before God one time there as he prayed. Danced. Confession number one. I've never done that. Ever. Confession number two. I may have, I may have been like Michael, criticizing David at first for his unbounded worship. Confession number three. I've repented of that awareness of where I am in the process. Confession number four, I'm trying out this idea of raising hands while praying and shouting my praises and singing my praises to God. Confession number five, it's not so bad. In fact, I'm beginning to like it. So you can find out that we can grow in these things, brethren. We're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Not stay the same. I have much, much more, but I'm almost out of time. Let me just quickly say this, that if you find praising hard, certainly as we sing hymns in church, we're praising. That's true. But it's more than that. Read the Psalms. Read the last 10 Psalms, especially Psalm 84 and Psalm 103 and the last 10 Psalms and so on. I would listen to good praise music. We bought some music and some of it we don't like. A lot of it we don't like. But we pick the ones we liked and we put them in a, in, in a way where we can listen to them. I'd say slow down. Ponder what God is doing in your life. Take some notes even. Write down some things as to what you see God teaching you and doing in your life. And I think the hurry up way of life we have is really blocking a lot of the things that God's doing. Blocking us from seeing the things that God's doing. Look for God's glory and His creation. That's why I love my office. I look out in the woods here behind my house, see deer walk out there once in a while. And uh, look for God's glory and His creation at times when God's presence are clear. When God's presence, you know, those times, times to worship. When you see a healing take place, take time to glorify and praise God. Say it! When someone tells you they've been, pra they've been healed, Say it. Say, praise God. Praise the eternal that you were healed. Say it. It says that when the healed leper, remember the Samaritan leper who was healed, the one out of ten, it says in Luke 17 that he came back to Jesus with a, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell at Jesus' feet worshiping. With a loud voice, he glorified God. The, the man who was healed in Acts 4, I think it was, uh, or was it 3, you know, where he's, he, the man who was a, a, a lame man, he was jumping up and down. How, how does all this end up, brethren? Okay, got to move here. Romans 14, 11 says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall give praise. And there are many, many uh, psalms that prophesy that all nations, all creation will come and praise the eternal. 
Now, here's how it ends. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. In the end, if we love our God and praise His name and His works, guess what? You think you can outpraise God? Wait till you see what God has in store for you. <clears throat> God is going to praise you before the Father, before all the millions of holy angels, before the 24 elders, the four living creatures, and the seraphim, and the cherubim. And you're going to be bowled over when the King of Kings says some words of praise to you about you in front of everybody. Yes, it's coming. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. And boy, you read that last phrase, and reveal the counsels of the hearts. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5. And you think, uh-oh, I'm going to be in trouble then. But now read the rest of the story. Then each one's praise will come from God. Why haven't I heard that preached and preached and preached? And 1 Peter 1, verses 6 to 8, it talks about how the genuineness of our faith is going to be tried and tested, being much more precious than gold, until it be found to honor and praise and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Brethren, brethren, you are going to have a new name. You are going to be praised by God if you love God and His praises more than the praises of man. Until next time, brethren, this is Philip Shields encouraging you to praise God with all your being. Let's end with Psalm 150. If I run out of time, keep reading it yourself. But please pass the word to other people that they've got to start learning this. We are spiritual Jews, spiritual praisers. Psalm 150. There's coming a time when God will praise those who've spent their lives praising and focusing on Him and His glory. You're going to be blown away when you get the new name and hear all that God's going to say. In the meantime, though, in Psalm 150, praise the Eternal, praise God in His sanctuary. We're the sanctuary of God, we're His temple. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to or because of His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and the harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with clashing cymbals. Imagine that. Let everything that has breath praise the Eternal. Praise the Eternal. Can we say it together?